Hi, Lee Farnell here. Now, what I'm going to do is share with you a conversation I had with Alastair McKenzie as part of one of our longer interviews. But in this interview, Alastair talked about how stoicism was a really powerful framework and tool and set of tools for him to make decisions, manage his life, manage his mental health and lead his best life. So if you don't know much about stoicism, then this will really help you because it really does start to focus on recognizing what you can and can't control, determining your reaction in a crisis, say ignoring people uh, who are dominated by negative emotions and mastering yourself. And Alistair talks about virtues and being virtuous and of course letting go of things and moving on. Uh, the founder of Stoicism. The purpose of life is happiness, which is achieved by virtue, living according to the dictates of reason, ethical and philosophical training, self-reflection, careful judgments, and inner calm. Look, there's a whole lot to this. Uh, you have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you'll find strength, Marcus Aurelius. So many great principles. And in fact, I know one of my directors, James Sutherland has, Marcus Aurelius' book, some meditations sitting next to his bed. Um, a lot of people use Stoicism, and of course, there's a lot more detail to it. So, hey, tune in to this conversation with Alistair and I and see what you can learn and how you can apply it in your life. Look forward to hearing what you say. Here we go. I think I've always tried to balance out, um, you know, the work component of my life. I've always been really active within community organisations, volunteering has played a large part um, of my journey. And I think, you know, volunteering, I would say a big reason why Buddy Up exists is because of the work that I did volunteering through football, the work that I did on, it was a volunteer position on the board as well. And I, I could safely say without those two experiences of picking up skills, meeting new people, I, I wouldn't be sitting here as as the the owner of a, of a business like Buddy Up. Um, but also, I've always had a big focus of looking after my own health as well. So it's, you know, I every exercise every morning, it's just something that I need to do um, just because I think it's a good way to start the day. But for my own mental health, um, it's uh, it's been, it's, it's really important. Um, and I think what's changed as well is um, I... Do a lot of study in Stoic philosophy, so that's something one of my interests outside oh. of out of my work. Um, so for me, it's about you know defining success within your own character and not using whether that's external material items or what people think of you through reputation of, as defining of um, what makes a person successful. Um, because I think the the moment you put um, your definition of success into something that's not in your control is the exact moment that you lose the ability to reach those to reach that success point. Mm. What got you triggered into Stoic philosophy? Where where were you introduced to that? Because I know uh, Tim Ferriss was probably one of the first people that I came across that was uh, in, introduced me to that. And uh, so, tell me what triggered you? Where mm. did you discover that whole concept of Stoic philosophy? Yeah, I think it was a book I read from Ryan Holiday. Must have been about close to ten years ago now. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, that was the the trigger, I guess. Um, and then from there, I've gone back and and really dived deeper into understanding the philosophy from a from its ancient context. So very much more focused now on the original text from the original ancient philosophers back in antiquity. Um, mm -hmm. And moved away, I guess, from you would say the more popularized versions. I'd probably put Tim Ferriss in part of that and Ryan hmm. Holiday. Um, I think they do good things to expose people to Stoic philosophy, but I think there's a tremendous amount of misunderstanding with the philosophy as well. Um, so it's yeah, just just working on my own journey to 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 gain that knowledge and try and use it to help me on my journey. Sure, and and as you say, provide a, a a thinking framework, a mental for how I go about making decisions or what I value or don't value. So just on that, coming back to we say uh, Aristotle, if we are we are what we repeatedly do, therefore excellence is not an act but a habit. So let's talk about your 
daily routine because your mm-hmm. mate Josh, by the way, was down the beach this morning. Josh Kruger, uh, he's regularly down the beach. They're at the coffee shop. By I was walking down the ramp at about uh, six o'clock. There he was. So a lot of lightning down the beach this morning. So we didn't mm-hmm. do a big swim. We just did a little uh, tea bag because we didn't want to get uh, fried. But most mornings, you know, we, we do our 2K or 4K or even longer in the summer. But tell me about your morning routine. What does your day start and look like? I, I saw a quote the other day, actually, win the morning, win the day. I love that. So tell me how you I win the it, morning. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I'm very much a routine-based person. So – the alarm goes off at 4.45 nice. and then I'm up and a um, cup of tea and generally start the day with a, a quick journal as well. So journaling something, a practice that I've picked up from Stoic philosophy. And then I'll rotate the my exercise based on the day. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday is running and then Tuesday, Thursday is ocean paddling. So get my exercise done. Um, I'm trying to do a bit of mobility training every day because I'm about as flexible as a, a light post. So I've incorporated that into the <laughs> morning routine. Flexible um, as a light post. I <laughs> can relate to that. I was at yoga last night, mate. Uh, and my yoga teacher, she, she does her best not to laugh when I'm trying to touch my toes, you know? Yeah. So, um, so getting there, it's, it's, it's been good. It's been good for me. I've, I think I'm six months in, been doing it five times a week, so Fantastic. I've committed to it. Um, so then usually I'll start my day at home just just to um, not have to deal with the freeway traffic. It's crazy, so isn't it? I'll, that's insane. Yeah. That's insane in itself. Every now and again, we get to someone conjure into a nine o'clock meeting or even a nine thirty meeting. You go, what am I doing here? This is just yeah. insane. So yes, that. Ability to work from home, coming back to freedom. So, okay, so you're working from home. Sorry, keep going. Yeah, yeah. So I work from home till about nine o'clock and then I'll come on into the office. So we've got a a centre and an office based in West Perth. Mm -hmm. So then usually I'll check in with, we have the day programs that run. So I'll head into the centre and uh, check in with the participants and the mentors. It's always good and positive to go in there and, and see the crew and then yeah then i'll just usually get into my into my day um the day usually involves meeting with participants meeting with parents and families and just the day-to-day management of the business really so we've got a team of uh, on the buddy upside we've got about 35 mentors that work within the organization fantastic Um, yeah so um i'm not delivering services on the ground anymore. You know, my role has, has evolved into more of that overall business management. Um, we've also started our sister organization called Sister Up. So equipment Fantastic. programs and services for our female friends. So there, and we were lucky that the the space next door was vacant. So now we've got our sisters as our next door neighbors. So, uh, but from a, from a business perspective, um, I'm managing both of those at, at the back end uh, with my wife who now is involved with the business who's overseeing Sister Up and then assisting with the day-to-day management of the organisation as well. Beautiful. So clearly now you've got 35 mentors. Um, you're shaping a culture. The, you want you know people singing off the same sheet, uh, common values, which brings me to the question of um, – mentors and leaders you've had in the past. And I think I'd like to talk about what you've seen and what you've seen in both good leaders and mentors in your life and career so far. And at the same time, what you've seen in not so good mentors and leaders, particularly you've done, you've done the MBA on the theoretical side, but your career you, and your football, you've, you've, you've clearly seen good and not so good leaders and mentors. So talk me through some of those characteristics and observations that you've had on both sides of the fence there? Yeah. I think if I reflect on what I've seen as a a good leader, I guess besides, you know, stepping in and leading by example, you know, never tasks and activities never been beyond that person. And we see that very much in the disability space as well as, you know, my, my approach is I'd never ask, one of my mentors to do something I would not do. And that could be anything from you know, just 
day-to-day -day assistance with a mentor right down to personal care, which is what we need to do sometimes as well. So um, try and, trying to lead by example. Um, mm. But I think the biggest thing for me, the best leaders I've seen is uh, are leaders that are consistent and predictable. And by that way, I mean things are going to go wrong. Um, that's just the nature of just mm. being a human being, I guess. Mm. Um, and... The good leaders, you know, when you walk in and tell them that you've stuffed up, you very much understand what their reaction is going to be. And that reaction could be pretty stern, come down on you, um, but they separate the people from the problem, move forward. Leaders where I have seen are not as um, influential or, or that I haven't, I guess, respected as much is you don't know how they're going to react. So... You might walk in and say something's happened and oh, I brush it off. You know, that's all good. You might come in with exactly the same type of problem the next day and their reaction is completely different. So mm. for me, I think it's, you know, it's not about, you know, leaders still need to have assertiveness and, and lead the way. But I think it's that, that predictability and consistency of the type of leader that they are is what I think can really help the team flourish as well. Mm, 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 exactly, mate. And uh, coming back to the, the environment you're in is empowering, giving people power, helping them discover how good they can be. Um, and so we, you know, when we were working with you guys, uh, we said leadership, we say leadership is everything. You know, the fish stinks from the head first. The speed of the group is determined by the speed of the leader. Uh, and certainly, you know, Jim Collins and level five leadership in terms of systems, vision, uh, but humility as well, you know, versus the leader that takes all the glory um the so i mean it's all there well and truly documented isn't it absolutely yeah i think that's a big one is where um and i got pulled up early days in my career um he was a great manager and he said you say my and i way too much it's always we mm -hmm. and that's a that's a lesson i've really taken um mm -hmm. and i try and use it the other way to say um using first person I and me when it, when I stuffed up. Yeah. But whenever there's success or good news um, as an organisation, it's always we and us and it's never me. Um, and that's something I've really been conscious of in building Buddy Up is, yeah, of course I started the business, but um, it's never been about me. It's always been about the broader um, mission that we're here to achieve and it's only because of, the team that I have, um, that we can do what what we can do. So, um, wherever I can remove myself from the successes and and build the success of what we do, at from buddy ups level and the team level, I'll, I'll always try and do that as well. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And um, let's talk a bit about uh, key influences, books you're reading. I love when people who say leaders are readers. So. Clearly, you have immersed yourself in education, but but what are some of the books you're either reading now or books that have made a big impact on you in terms of your own decision making and leading your own best life? Yeah, so just given, I'm going to sound really boring here, but essentially all I read now is is around Stoic philosophy. Um, so at the moment, I'm reading a book you know, aptly named Stoicism by John Sellers, mm -hmm. um, and that's because I'm I'm also doing a, a course at the moment. Um, the Stoic Philosophy Fundamental course based out of the US and that's the required reading. So I'm, I'm on to my second reading of that. Um, but really powerful books in that space, you know, there are the, the I guess, your modern-day authors in Tim Ferriss and Ryan Holiday, but the, the biggest impact I've got is actually going back to the original sources. So most people would have heard of probably Marcus Aurelius, who was mm -hmm. the Roman emperor and probably the most famous Stoic philosopher, um, I've got Epictetus' discourses next to my bed at the moment. Um, and the beauty about those books is you can just pick them up and there's so many chunky lessons. You can you don't have to read it from front to back. You can pick it up, turn to a page, turn to a discourse and, and, and take so much out of it as well. So I love going back to those books. I've read Meditations by Marcus Aurelius probably three times, Epictetus twice. So I've kind of taken this approach now where um, I'm not trying to read as many books as I can. I'm not trying to tick off a book a week. I'm actually just immersing myself 
in a really uh, a handful of key books that mm -hmm. I can take so much from. And you and you learn something different every time you read it as well because wow. your stoic um, knowledge and practice has evolved. Therefore, you, you you're consuming it in a different way. Um, Absolutely, there's a great quote, Heraldicus. A uh, person can never step into the same river twice. Each time you step in the river, you're different and the river's different. The same being, as you yeah. say, when you're reading those books, each time you read it, you go, well, that's the same book. How can I be getting something else out of it, as you say, um, because you've moved on. So tell me, give me a couple of lessons, even in the last 24, 48 hours, a chunk that's come out and hit you um, for the second or third time. That's my buddy, hell, that's just a, a great lesson. Give me a couple of those. Yeah, so I think the biggest thing I've taken away from it, and it's something that that you know I'm working on. You know, it's it's a lifelong journey, so philosophy, and you're never going to affect it. That's I guess that's the the beauty of it. But it's that um, we talk about defining success, and from a philosophical perspective, um, they say that living a virtuous life and having a virtuous character is defines what a good life looks like um and we use the i guess the term what does that mean virtuous sense. virtue what does that mean a virtuous life a virtuous character so the cardinal virtues from uh the four cardinal virtues are courage justice temperance or self-control and wisdom mm -hmm. and essentially the the stoics would say that to live a, a life of eudaimonia which translates in its simplest terms to happiness but there's much it's a much broader meaning i think the, the English translation doesn't do the word justice, um, but I look at that as more how do you develop good character? And by leaning back onto those virtues, if, if in every situation you can approach that, taking into account the virtues, then you should be able to develop a good life. The Stoics said that there are, you know, there's nothing inherently good outside of the virtuous life. Um, everything external are what they refer to as indifference so um, you can have preferred indifference so we'd prefer to be healthy than ill you know, prefer to have money than not have money but just because we don't have those things that are out of our control doesn't mean that we still can't create a good life and we can't create a good character so that's probably the fundamental lesson i guess that the ethical side of stoic philosophy tries to teach um, but also the probably the biggest one that I have to work on every day is it's not things that upset us, but our judgment of things. Oh, so, yes. Oh, isn't that inc That's such a powerful statement. You know, it's not things that upset us, it's our judgment of things. Yeah. Yeah. Man. So, and that, you know, that thing helps me significantly in everyday life, but particularly, you know, as a young lad, I used to get, angry very easily and still, you know, still, still get angry here and then, but, um, you know, understanding what's driving that anger and taking that time and that opportunity to reflect on the, what they call the impression. And then whether you're assenting to a false or a true judgment as well. So it's that taking that time to reflect internally what's actually happened. Is it a false judgment that we're making the next decision upon? How do we understand that and what is the most appropriate way to act from what's just happened? And there will be times where things are will, will make you upset or angry, but trying our best not to make that next decision and action based upon anger mm. or being upset. Mm -hmm. I think, I think um, one of the great psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, Viktor Frankl, talked about that gap between stimulus and response rather than knee-jerk reaction. And, of course, as you say, somewhere between that gap between stimulus and response is the judgment or the perception of the stimulus. And the other component of that, which is interesting, because, as you know, we've been running this group called Blokes Talk Beachside where we get guys together uh, and we will have a speaker, but essentially it's an opportunity for blokes to get together and talk about their what inner world, you know, basically what, what, what's the shit that's going on in their, their life. Um and, and boy, boy, you know, everyone's on their own journey with ex SAS people and people who've had marriage breakups and health problems and lost their jobs or been kicked out of their companies or all sorts of things. And um, most guys have had done little or no 
you study them, and here you are, you've immersed yourself in stoicism. But a lot of guys have spent little or no time, and we say, guys, we want you turning the eyeballs inwards. You don't just keep looking out there at blaming your wife or the government, or but that ability to take a look at the inner world. Um, and we had a guy a month or two ago, and he was very, very angry. Now, as as his story came out, something about his his wife had some court case and he wasn't able to see his kids and all of these things. But we talked about the fact that, mate, if you approach the problems in your life from an elevated state of fight or flight or, you know, ongoing anger, you know, says, well, therefore adrenaline, no adrenaline, cortisol, all the internal chemicals, the neurotransmitters are up. Um, therefore, any stimulus, everything from someone stealing your parking space to spilling of the paper clips, you're going to go off like a two-bob watch. Um, and so the gap between stimulus and response is not that big a gap at all. But once you say, there is a gap, and I can choose to judge it, and at the same time, if I bring down my set point, my, my point of fight or flight, which can come through running in the morning, swimming, meditation, journaling, and ideally a combination of all of those things, all of a sudden... You're approaching problems or life in general from a much calmer place, a much healthier place, and the gap between stimulus and response is a much bigger gap. So as you say, as a young guy, you can fly off like a two-bob watch because at that point, who's ever talked to you about stoicism or stimulus response or meditation or any of these things? Um, and I would think at the same time, helping your clients, your buddy up clients, your your young guys who are going through their own thing, the more you can be exposing them to the possibility that there's choice in response. Um, it, it's going to make a huge talk about a lifelong impact on them for the rest of their days, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I think it's, and it's interesting where, and this is where we, I don't think we get confused, but there is a difference between, you know, an immediate almost involuntary reaction which is being programmed by for me 38 years of experience um to then processing the emotion and the stoics separate those two things so they use the example of if you know there's a there's a loud bang or something else you know the body is going to sh shiver and shudder and you just can't control that that's an involuntary reaction to, to an external stimulus based upon your experience that loud bangs usually means something's happening, but then you can process and go, okay, that's a loud bang. Someone's just dropped something over there. I'm in no danger. My emotional responses continue as, mm -hmm. as uh, is normal. Um, and that's been really powerful for me where I used to even, you know, on the early journey in Stoic, my practice of Stoic philosophy is I'd get, angry at myself for getting angry at the situation. <laughs> like, oh, well, I shouldn't have got angry at that. You're an idiot. Yeah. But yeah, then it's right, like right. accepting that, you know what, that's 38 years of programming that's very yeah. difficult to just change overnight. I'm working yeah. on it. Mm. So not getting angry, not not being hard on yourself, be like that situation ang angered me. But just knowing that you're making progress because you've identified that you've just gotten angry for no reason and that next emotional response or the way that you continue on, um, you've actually improved the way you would have approached the situation in the past. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm not sure if that makes too much sense or not. No, no, but yeah, what, you, what, you, what you're triggering me there is the word judgment because what, what I've done over the last few years, uh, one of the guys that swim with us, we first of all, talking about uh, an Indian yogic called Sadhguru who has millions of followers around the world to so listen to him on podcasts and so on. Um, and so then my mate is a doctor, an Irish doctor, who's a very smart guy, went to the Buddhist center out in, in Nolamara. And so I, I started going there to do meditation on a Friday night. And and the Buddhists talk about being kind to yourself, uh, compassion and 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 judgment. What a to almost to a, to a certain extent, what a waste of time and energy. And yes, we need to judge in terms of our own safety or money or investments, but often we overjudge. And as you say, um, you, you use the word judgment before in terms of stoicism, it, like being very, very careful about what you judge. And interestingly, a mate of mine who was an old surfing buddy, 
We went on all the holidays together. Uh, he got brain cancer and died uh, uh, a year a year ago. In fact, we scattered his ashes, which, of course, that in itself puts things in sharp mm -hmm. contrast for you as to, mate, we're all heading in that direction. Uh, at one stage, when he had the tumour taken out, he says, I've decided to be less judgmental and and more magnanimous. And what he meant was just be gr being grateful for everything basically every day, every breath, every vision of the ocean. And I, I, I thought, and I, thought yeah, I could tell, one of the reasons his anxiety was so high was he's constantly judging either himself or others. And what that then does, if you're constantly judging, because that's the other thing about neural pathways, is if you've got good at being judging of others, you can be pretty certain the person's judging themselves, not always, but judging themselves. So coming back to you, 35 or 37 years of of judging of course you've developed very good neural pathways in that area and what now you want to do is to be developing neural pathways in different mm -hmm. areas in terms of not being judgmental or being kind to yourself or you know as you say going through that decision making tree that you just talked about in terms of i'm not in danger uh, no one's been hurt okay no need to and not only that there's another buddhist story which talks about um Two Buddhists uh, were in an order where they weren't to talk to and certainly not touch women. I don't know if you've heard the story, and, and they, they're walking on this this journey, and they get to a stream, and there's a, a woman on one side, a young, beautiful woman on the one side saying, please, could you guys carry me to the other side because my 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 fiancé is over there and I can't get over there. I'll, I'll drown on my own. And the older monk just picked her up and carried her across. And the young monk just couldn't believe what he'd just seen. He was so angry, even though he's a supposedly enlightened creature. And miles and miles went on. And eventually the young, uh, the older monk said, well, you see, something seems to be wrong. What, what's going on? He's gone, you, I, just, I'm, I just can't believe you, you, you not only spoke to the woman, you picked her up and you carried her across. I just can't believe you did that. And the old monk said, well, I put her down on the other side of the river but you seem to be carrying her mm -hmm. for the last two hours. Put her down as well, you know. Uh, and and I thought it's just a beautiful story around what the hell we hang on to and ruminate and let upset our internal world and our internal chemistry because that's having an impact on the in, in the internal world. All that judgment, all that rumination goes on and on, which again – by working with the people you're working with, it gives you an opportunity to do all of that kind of sharing and empowering because where do people learn these things? Um, you know, with a bit of luck, maybe some football coach or somebody exposes mm. them, not necessarily to Buddhism or any of that, but just in terms of the choice, the choice in thinking. So what are your comments or reactions to what I've just said there? Yeah, I think what I was reflecting on the story you were telling then is I can put it from a stoic context is the older Buddhists, chose what was the right thing to do so you know everything is contextual yeah so there was a there was a you know the, the fundamental belief that you can't touch something but um as you know, stoic uh, practitioners very much see themselves as citizens of the cosmos so we are we are here to exist to help one another mm. um you know i would reflect on that being the right thing to do was to help that person it probably went against what they've been taught in isolation, but you know the right, the virtuous thing to do was to to help that that lady across the uh, across the across the pond. So that's probably what I reflected on it. But but more broadly, I think you know judgment is a. I think judgment is something that is having a really detrimental effect on society as we know it. I think I think there is. Um, we're just creating, you know, just it's just, I guess, the, the the consequence of a capitalist society, but we are just creating such an individualistic society. I mm. think that's to the the detriment of of good things that can be done. And I think looking at from a judgment perspective, and something you know, I've really tried to work on is um, withholding that judgment on a person's situation, um, because my my really fundamental belief, and I had a really robust discussion with my brother about this last night is, you know, 80% of 
what's happened to you is decided before you've been able to make a decision you know, where you were born, who your parents were, what colour is your skin, what is your name, have you got a disability, haven't you got a disability. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that people don't make the most of their opportunities. Absolutely they do. But I think people need to acknowledge and understand it's because of the opportunities that allowed them to get where they are and often I think people misinterpret that as it's only down to pure hard work and their own grit and determination mm, that they mm. are where they are today. Mm. And I think that's quite dangerous mindset because that's when I think compassion goes out the window. Mm, because mm. It's easy to say, oh, I did it. Why can't mm. you do it? Mm, and not mm. taking into account pretty much most of the situation that they're in. They've had no actual uh, opportunity or or decision points to to make that the case. Oh, absolutely, mate. You're making me think immediately of, well, firstly, you know, Water Polo Club, UWA, uh, City Beach, you know, the bulk of the uh, kids in that club, uh, Western suburbs, born and raised, uh, and the and the and and probably the vast majority of those have all gone to, you know, non-government schools. Um, so they're already very privileged. And then mm-hmm. you've got some in that group who, who clearly have gone to the best of schools, uh, the best of advice, and and even then been uh, parachuted into their family businesses. And somewhere in their head is, I'm a self-made man, and I, and if, if only if only everyone did what I did, uh, the world would be a much better place. It's like whoa, there's a, yeah. a bit of distortion and delusion going on there. And not only that, as you you know, the, the, for me, the the perfect example. There's two scenarios come to mind. One, the fact that there's a guy that's running for the White House right now who lives in a gold tower in New York, and and not only that, lies about how big the joint is, even <laughs> to the point where the guy that spent six months with him writing the book, The Art of the Deal, who followed him around, just could not believe the number of lies the guy told. He said the guy literally lacks a moral compass, talk about virtuous or lack of virtue, um, to the point where he's got a, a, a copy of a, Van Gogh or, you know, Rodin print or something in his office. And everyone knows the original is actually in the Louvre. And this guy will will argue till he's blue in the face that the one he has is actually the original. Like, and you go, it's it's just talk about virtuous or lack of virtue. Um, and, and at the same time, this same guy uh, in the last debate talked about anyone that paid taxes was a fool. <laughs> um, and you know, and that the smart people don't pay taxes. So then you go, okay. Mm-hmm. So how do schools? How do schools? How does the health system? How does how do roads get built, mate? What well, only the idiots pay for the roads? And yet, when we went to play water polo in Sweden a, a number of years ago, now, if you listen to someone like that, you'd say, well, the Swedes and the Scandinavians must hate their life because there's so much tax. But you go there. They're happy, they're healthy, they're proud of their health system, they're proud of their roads. They can literally tell you what percentage of people visit the library and how good. So there's a real sense of social connection and even to the point where in recent times I came across an article talking about Finland and uh, and documentary. They said you literally can't tell the difference between the wealthy suburbs and the not-so-wealthy suburbs in those places because materialism is not the KPI living in the gold tower being the winner and everyone else being the losers mm-hmm. so to to live in on the same planet with two incredibly different paradigms um and you even use the term social democracy or uh, and the 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 right wingers in the states will call you a communist it's like what planet are you living on guys not the least of which another mate of mine greg campbell who actually got me involved in consulting way back in the 80s has spent the last 30 years with the Aboriginals up in Broome and written a 700-page book. Um, and, and a key part of Aboriginal culture is, one, the environment is a living, breathing member of the family. That is, so just like any other member of the family, you take care of it versus, no, no, you dig holes in it, you rape and pillage. And, 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 and again, Sadhguru talks about the importance of the topsoil. If we have less than something like 6 or 7% um, organic material in the topsoil, you can't grow anything in it. And he said, we're all food. So you mm-hmm. can only, so there's all of these factors, but the people living in these gold towers, 
only losers worry about that kind of thing, mate. So um, that's we could talk about. That's a whole other topic. But let me ask you this uh, question: what What does the future hold for Alistair McKenzie and uh, Buddy Up and Sister Up? If I look talk to you in five years' time, what what yeah. will happen? Well, personally, we we've, we've got a baby on the way, so that's oh, exciting. well done, so, mate. Yeah, that's gonna so that's we're, gonna we're, change things. Yeah, exactly. So we're we're fifteen weeks in at the moment, so still reasonably early, early, but early days. Yeah, yeah, at a stage where we get to know people. So I'm thinking my life's going to change significantly. And, well, I hope it does, as it should. Um, mm. Maybe the the morning routine might be a little bit disrupted. Mm. Um, look, for from buddy up and sister up's perspective. Um, I think there's, you know, there's obviously a lot more that we can do um, and, you know, taking the experience from the men's health conference last week, um, you know, that mental health space is significant. So right now, you know, our focus is disability space um, because it's, you know, where my experience had been through football, um, but then the NDIS also allows such services to to operate. And I think that's where, to your point earlier, is we're hearing the worst of the NGIS at the moment in the media. Um, and it just, as, as with everything, it's politicised. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff happening as well. And, and we sincerely believe that the, the, pro, the programs and services that we deliver do have a really positive impact on our participants. But there's so much more we can do. So next for us, you know, I, I find it hard to look, five years out because so much changes within 12 months. Sure. Um, but for us, it's about how do we, how do we uh, increase the, the number of participants that we reach? So, you know, we're actively looking at regional opportunities at the moment. Um, I was up at Geraldton last week or a couple of weeks ago talking to some local providers up there about how we can take Buddy up, up there and help, help um, their participants and citizens heading down to Rockingham tomorrow, engaging with their local uh, council just to see what we can do to, to take Buddy Up down there. So for me, I'd love to see Buddy Up operating in all the major regions in Western Australia. Um, and I think that can only be done collaboratively. I don't sit here and pretend that we know everything and can do everything. It definitely takes support from a government perspective, but it also, I think for us to do it well, it will be partnering with good operators in those areas that know the towns, that know the people, and then we can come in and help them deliver a program that we have seen that that, that we know works and, and delivers good outcomes. So for us, I think it's about just, you know, having more of a reach and, and helping as many West Australians as we can without fundamentally losing what makes Buddy Up and Sister Up what they are. You see it often, particularly in the disability space, you grow too big and it just becomes a big almost corporate machine worrying about finance and HR and everything else and then losing the essence of you know, why Buddy Up and Sister Up begun in the first place. Mm -hmm. That intimacy, so, the intimacy factor, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Alistair, we've covered a ton of great stuff. I love taking notes during these sessions, so I'm just going to go through some of my notes here. One, the fact that you won the Men's Health Professional mm -hmm. of the Year last year. Fantastic, mate. The fact you have 35 mentors, um, therefore you've already got an organisation, and, and as we talked about, the importance then of an alignment, a singing off the same hymn page as in values and touch points and, and client experience you want. Your point that everyone is on their own journey, including including you and me, but the power of uh, stoicism and, as you say, the virtuous thing to do, the virtuous thing to do, leading by example and as a leader, the consistency and predictability, journaling in the morning besides the exercising, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then the Thursday and Tuesday, the paddling. Um, I love that. Citizens of the cosmos. It's, it's not dissimilar to even the Aboriginal concept of oneness. We're all, we're all, in, we're all in this together. We're all in this journey together. And, and and you've talked about not only leading of yourself, leading of others, leading of the organisation and your teams, um, and the fact that it all started, I mean, well, obviously football, but then integrated, and interestingly, the power of volunteering. By volunteering, that's what's led to where you are today. Yes, your career and work, 
and I can say, as you're talking, I remember with the, all the things, whether it be Blokes Talk Beachside with me or Pod Squad or National Speakers Association, the the things that I've learned and the contacts I've made through volunteering. And I think that's such a powerful, a powerful uh, message. And then we also talked about our judgment of things. It's not what happens, it's our judgment and and being very, very careful in how we use how we use judgment. So some great examples and tips there on leading your best life. And of course, in your case, shaping and helping others do the same. Mate, is there anything we haven't talked about you'd like me to talk about or ask a question of you before we move into the home straight? No, I think you've pretty much nailed it. So yeah, we've got, you know, I guess with the mentors as well, we've also got a really great team of, we've got 12 female mentors on the sister upside as well. Fantastic. Um, so, and I guess there was a couple of things to pick up on as well. I think there's a lot of connection and similarities between Stoic philosophy and Indigenous culture. So mm -hmm. I'd love to see more, you know, whether it's research done around that because absolutely um, um, the Stoic philosophy from, you know, it's a systematic philosophy of physics, logic and ethics, and they fundamentally believe that God was part of nature and, and nature is a living, breathing thing, which is the tie-in with the Indigenous culture there. Um, and I guess just to finish, you know, with the judgment thing is, um, as you were talking about Trump and things, I was kind of churning in my belly, um, but one of the best sayings I heard was that it's easy to score a home run when you start on third base. So let's not, <laughs> let, let's, let's not forget right. the people that are starting at first base and, and help them around as well. So, Here, here. What a great, what a great saying, mate. That's fantastic. I'm just going to do two things. I want to share. Firstly, here is Greg Campbell's book, Total Reset, where you can, uh, it's a, just a ripper and, and it, you can get it. It's on Audi, it's on Audible and it's also on Spotify if you're on Spotify. So I highly recommend that for people who want to immerse themselves in uh, Indigenous uh, uh, culture. I mean, I've learned so much, particularly on the one, the, the relationship with environment and the environment being a relative and the oneness, the oneness. So we're all in this together. And he talks about Lulu, the, the, the tribal elder, talks about sitting at the bottom of everything. Um, where where you realise we're actually all in this we're all in this together uh, and of course so if people want to get hold of you Alistair there you are on LinkedIn um, people can access uh, Alistair there on on LinkedIn and of course here at uh, buddyup buddyup.com.au mate you're doing absolutely fantastic fantastic uh, work and I can see what you're doing is going to continue to grow as you extend your your influence and your your love and your caring uh, for people. Um, in a nutshell, give us three key tips then uh, that would summarise leading your best life, be it your life, having reflected on your life today, or helping others lead their life. What would be three pieces of advice you'd give? Yeah, I think um, don't be too hard on yourself. You're going to make mistakes. So just, just learn from it and, and move forward. For me, discipline eats motivation for breakfast. So get up, do the small things well every discipline day. Discipline eats motivation for breakfast. I love that, mate. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. That gets me out of bed in the winter often. Yes. Um, and, you know, life's about compound interest. If you do the small things every day, they'll turn up to be something quite significant. Wow, uh, mate, what gems you've just given us there. Alistair, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up, mate. Um, we'll get this out to people and uh, we'll continue to make a difference and let's see what we can do to, to help each other as we move forward. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And I'll just have one last little plug. If people do are interested in Stoic philosophy, I do run a meetup every month, Perth Stoa on Facebook. So I'd love you to get involved and it's just an opportunity to learn the philosophy in more detail and meet like-minded people who want to go on that journey and, and help each other as well. So great, mate. Any interest, get involved. I'll put that, I'll put that in the notes of the, uh, you know, each of the podcasts and where, where we, where we post it. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Great talking to you, Alistair. See you, mate. Thanks, Lee. Always All a the pleasure, best. mate. Bye-bye. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye.
Thank you.